Hello, hello. Thank you, everyone, for coming to another session of our Tuesday Times Roundtable, sponsored by the New York Times. We are very excited about the talk and the guest speaker today. Uh, but first, before I introduce him, I want to mention a couple of house um, keeping items. We have, okay, as you guys know, please wait for the microphone to ask a question so it goes on the, on the video. Um, what else? We have a special event. There's some flyers in the back. Uh, we have um, the New York Times keynote lecture fe featuring journalist Caitlin Dickerson next Monday in SIPA 103 and on Tuesday at BBC. Uh, to find out more, you can either go online, follow us in social media, or get some of the flyers. Um, if you're a medallion student, you get two points for attending that um, special event. What else? We have two scholarships opportunities. They close in March, so please take one of these flyers if you need help funding your projects. Um, or whatever it is that you're working on, please take one of these. Um, we still have like a month left uh, for the applications. One more thing, most of you already know, but for those that don't, starting this semester, honors points. Um, for those that are honor students, these talks count as honors points. So please make sure, to, but you have to, of course, stay until the end. Please make sure to see me or Taylor so we can sign off um, your points. Thank you so much, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Advi Javasadeh. He, he's an associate professor at St. Thomas University and an adjunct professor at FIU's um, Labor Studies Center. He has taught many subjects in crimin criminology, criminology and sociology for 20 years in several universities. His current research includes global minimum wage and the means of implementation around the globe. In addition, he continues his research on the implementation of restorative justice statewide and nationwide. He has worked on many issues of social justice in South Florida and is currently on the board of directors at the Miami Workers Center and the board of directors at the gun, gun violence chapter at Pact, people acting for community together. He's currently working <clears throat> with FIU Law Clinic on bringing an end to this Florida death penalty. His expertise is on social movements, political and so sociological theories, international criminology, sociology of terrorism, and Middle East uh, politics. He has done extensive research on Iran and the Middle Eastern social and political movements, and has pu published a book, Iranian irony, and articles about American foreign policy in the Middle East and postmodernism and terrorism as contemporary social phenomena. He has ta taught courses in criminal justice and sociology is, uh, <clears throat> and is currently the director for the master's program in criminal justice. Also, personal note, he taught one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite professors, one of my favorite um, classes on terrorism, not to be a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was an excellent class, um, so I'm, I'm really um, grateful that he's um, sharing his time and expertise with us today, so please join me in giving him a warm welcome. Thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, I think this is my fourth time doing one of the round tables. And um, so the topic today is ideology of neoliberalism and global inequality. Um, in order to do this, I think I need to explain what ideology is, what neoliberalism is, and then, of course, global inequality. I'll give you some facts and figures on it. Um, oh, this works. OK. <laughs> So ideology, uh, ideology usually when I ask my students what they think about ideology and what they think that is, uh, basically the answers are correct, but the way I'm using ideology and I use the notion of ideology or that terminology is in terms of false consciousness. So it is a worldview, uh, it's a belief and value system, it's actually a generalization, uh, which means you don't change your ideas to fit reality, but you change reality to fit your ideas. And it's pretty closed. And if you ever hear politicians talk about ideology, they usually, usually say, that's ideological. That means you're tailoring it to the way you think. Uh, it's a political belief system. And especially important, it's a false consciousness. And when I say false consciousness, it means 
it's somebody else's ideas that probably benefits that entity, that group, that person to create those ideas, but we take upon it as if it's our own, even though it may be against your own interest. So that's how I, I'm using ideology in terms of false consciousness. Uh, and it's the imagined existence of things as it, re as it relates to the real conditions of ex existence. That is, it is imaginary, according to Althusser, of course. Uh, liberalism. Liberalism, as all of you know, has a long history. And like I say up here, it goes back to the end of 17th century in the 1690s, um, initially originated by John Locke. And uh, where, where the idea, where you see there in orange, it's market under the supervision of state. And if you know anything about Adam Smith and his economic liberalism, he didn't say completely hands off for the state, but actually the state that supervises the market. So liberalism, it is a political theory or a philosophy, whichever way you want to put it, based on individual rights, uh, free market, free trade, unlimited government to smaller, the smaller the better. Um, and which is something that you hear all the time when you uh, listen to Democrats, capital D, and Republicans. Um, Democrats always refer to government as big, and we want a bigger government because government should play a role in people's lives. And Republicans usually smaller government um, and less and less employment by the government and even less and less taxes. So smaller the government, the better. Uh, it's secular, uh, which means it leaves you to choose your religion or non-religion, if you want, um, and holds within it the freedom of speech, freedom of press, and it's in opposition to uh, hereditary privilege, which is the era before liberalism, or actually the era before enlightenment in Europe. That is during the Enlightenment, what people were saying, really famous in the quotation of um, Descartes saying, I think, therefore I am. Um, the, the real emphasis there is I, that is, I'm the one who has that ability to do what I want to do, uh, as opposed to religious entities, as opposed to Vatican, as opposed to God, and as opposed to these bigger things that would control your life. So uh, at the same time, it's based on meritocracy, so you don't inherit anything. Uh, it's really your merit that should qualify you for jobs, for your status in society, and so forth. Um, and it's opposed to state religion. No state should really hold any religion. It should free the population to choose their religion. And also the population should be able to keep their religion to themselves and then less and less state regulation. So state doesn't really play a role in politics, in economy, and in culture, and so forth. Neoliberalism. Uh, neoliberalism is really, uh, as you can see, Keynes, Keynesian economy and problem of surplus capital. Uh, that's a little um, too economic, I think, for us. But these are the things that neoliberalism um, follows. If I just wanted to briefly talk about neoliberalism, it's the same as liberalism, that is the free market. However, uh, if you can think back when Adam Smith published his book, Wealth of Nations, this is 1776, right, 244 years ago. 244 years ago, uh, we basically did not have any monopolies in the market. There were no companies, no corporations. Uh, if there were a very small number that monopolized any, um, any commodity, any services. That is, you can actually say it was a competition be between mom and pops. Uh, and that competition may have been able to be kept up without state intervention because, as Adam Smith argued, you can bring your product into the market and, and decide demand whether you have good quality product, whether your business will th thrive or not. Uh, whereas in terms of today's society, that is uh, 
I don't think you can actually think of any product or service that's not monopolized. I'm not talking about there aren't, for example, mom and pops uh, making sandwiches or creating something for the, as, as a product for the market. But if there is a product, anything that's in front of you, anything that you're wearing, anything, any car that you drive, any medicine that you take, um, anything that has to do with your life is probably monopolized. Or there are several uh, corporations that are controlling that product. And um, I think I have it up there in the green where you see monopoly and oligopoly. Oligopolies are a group of monopolies that decide not to necessarily compete against each other. So I'll give you an example. Uh, in the late 1970s, we had, and of course, you know, we had a, a gas crisis in early 1970s, 73, 74. And so after that, Americans were looking for smaller engine cars, you know, not the gas guzzlers. And this is coinciding with Toyota exporting exporting their cars into the American culture. So smaller engine, four-cylinder usually, uh, using less gas and qualitatively even better cars. They were also able to present their cars in the, prod in the market of American culture with even lower prices than American cars. And the argument of monopolies against each other and driving prices down and therefore maybe even profits down uh, should have worked. But if you look at just the automobile industry, from the early 1980s up until today, instead of prices going down, they're actually going up with all automobiles. And you would think, well, if there's competition between these monopolies, why aren't prices going down? Because, you know, you would, as a consumer, go out and buy cars that are cheaper. So if you look at four-cylinder engines, six-cylinder engines, eight-cylinder engines, if they're still producing them, there are some, uh, you'll see that SUVs, sedans, two-door cars, what have you, all types and models continue to increase in price. The reason why that's happening is what I have up there that is oligopolies. So you see that, for example, the people that sit on the board of Toyota uh, also sit on the board of GM, also sit on the board of Volvo, also sit on the board of Ford, also sit, and so forth. That is, they are actually regulating their own um, their own commodities, their own market. And that's why prices keep going up because they come to agreement. And I don't mean this as a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. It's actually legal to do. Uh, they sit and they agree on prices, basically, and they increase prices accordingly. Had that not been done, prices of all commodities that are monopolized should go down. But that's not happening. It actually keeps increasing. That's part of neoliberalism, which is borrowing from the ideas of liberalism of about 250, 300 years ago, and says we can do the same thing today given monopolies and oligopolies. Practically impossible. Even if you have a small business and um, you produce something really good that's, that's, that's uh, wanted in the market, goods or services, either one, and there is a market for your product or your service. Uh, and if you are successful, it takes about two days, the monopoly to devour you. They will buy you out in two days, three days, if they find that you're being useful. They either make it their own and keep giving out the same product as you were, but they now bought it, or they will completely annihilate it because it's competing with their own product. So. You, as even a small business owner, can last maybe a year or two. You know, that time for you to become successful, or, you know, show your entrepreneurship and show that there's something that you have that's qualitatively good for the market. So in, in these cases today in the world, it's almost impossible to compete with any, with any of these monopolies. Think about, you know, as a monopoly like Walmart. When they set up shop anywhere, 
whether it's in China, Mexico, Alabama, it doesn't matter, immediately small businesses around them go bankrupt. No question. Because they can't actually compete with, number one, the labor, the cheap labor that they use worldwide, and the cheap products that they, uh, they put out in the market. No mom and pop business can actually compete with that. Um, and it almost doesn't matter what kind of a business they are. At least anything, any goods and services that's being presented by, the, by Walmart or companies as such in the, in the, in the market. Um, so another thing in the blue I have is financialization of the economy. That's really, really imperative, imperative today. If you ever visit Madison Square Garden in New York, I don't know, maybe some of you have been there recently, there's a national debt number that's running there, uh, which is now 21.8 trillion. That is the national debt in America, which is the red. So that is the money that the U.S owes to other banks and other countries and other institutions. And you, you can't really see the last digits. They're running so fast. It just looks like zeros because the last digits in amounts of tens of dollars and dollars are changing so fast. Now, there's a lot of economists who say this is a bad idea. Why do we owe so much money? Why is it increasing? It's actually increasing one and a half billion dollars a day because that's how much we're borrowing, borrowing every day. Uh, but a lot of economists actually disagree with that. They think this is healthy. The reason why they think such financialization, that is borrowing money, is healthy, is because now in many countries and many markets, the main economy is the red economy. That is the money that is being owed in one form or another, which is the basic economy. So right now, if you take... Let's just say, hypothetically, if you take indebtedness out of the picture, many economies in the world, namely U.S. economy, would collapse because that's at least 50% of the profits that's being made, which is contrary to the exact notion of liberalism. That is, there has to be a market because capitalism has products to present in the market for people to buy. Now... Capitalism from going from money to commodity to more money, so profits, and then you reinvest, has now gone from money to make more money. That is, most of the wealth that's being produced in the world, based on the neoliberal ideas, is not based on selling commodities, but by finance companies and lending money and the hedge funds and all of that. All of those things is an economy in the red. That is, most of the world is functioning in the red, and because it's creating so much wealth, many economists think it's a bad idea to get rid of indebtedness. I mean, it's something unbelievable, but it's the result of financialization. It's the result of the neoliberal policy because that's how they think the economy should be run under those notions. Um, like I said at the very bottom, no longer violations of principles of competition, but um, manifestations of competition. So that's how com competition is set up. So under neoliberalism, state is under super supervision of market. And pay attention to that first statement, states under supervision of market. Look around the world in large economies. The people who are the leaders of countries don't come from political science and similar fields because it, it's politics. They all come from a business background because business is running the world. Right? I mean, look at the president in the U.S. right now. Comes from strictly a business background. Um, and, and many presidents, prime ministers in the world come from business background. And most of us actually think if you're a successful businessman, businesswoman, you can run a country too. And we're not mistaken because these countries, our countries are being run based on the market model, not based on what is justice, not based on um, what is equality, not based on what really people need to be given by uh, their states because people are choosing their states and, and voting for states, but actually based on 
you know, what, what profits and what makes more sense uh, in the market. And that's why p leaders of the countries are mostly people who are or have been in the, in the market or have been running businesses. Um, economic liberal liberalization, like I said, no really intervention by the, by the government or by the state in the economy. Uh, Norquist said famously, we're gonna make the state so small we can drown it in a bathtub, which is quite picturesque. I don't know what he was thinking when he said that. Um, deregulation, that is government really pays no attention to what you guys are doing in the market and you're actually free to do that. And uh, many laws that were regulating banks, that were regu regulating corporations are now gone. Uh, part of deregulation just offhand is uh, getting rid of usury laws. Everybody knows what usury is, as you lend money and ask for it with interest, which is even biblically uh, sinful. So we have, we still have usury laws. That is, uh, no credit card or any financial institution can charge more than 19.9% in interest. But clearly, we know of many entities that charge way more than that. It goes up to 30%, 35%. Some of these uh, uh, cash checking places where they lend you money, they lend you money up to 450%, 500% interest. I mean, that's clearly usury. However, you can get away with that because two states, form, uh, initially Delaware and then South Dakota, uh, got rid of their usually, usury laws. So if you look at your uh, credit card bills, if your interest is more than 19.9%, chances are that the headquarter of the company is either in Delaware or South Dakota, because that's where it's legal, because that's where it's deregulated. So they can charge you any amount of interest that they want or any percentage of interest that they want. Um, the blue is privatization. One way to privatize, and this is, uh, I give you clear examples of this, two examples at least, uh, on school, uh, public school, and prison. One way to privatize, that is to convince people that so-and-so entities should be privatized, is to make it fail. And once you make it fail, and you make it fail by, by not really funding it, but not by not uh, qualitatively paying attention to it and so on. So in, in terms of school, not giving teachers high salaries, not hiring teachers where they're needed, not having equipment in schools. Some schools, public schools, students don't get their books until six, seven months into the, into the year. Um, and the discrepancy between, for example, in Florida, I'll give you the numbers for New York, too. Uh, in Florida, the, the poorest districts pay $4,700 per pupil per year, per student per year. Richest districts pay $57,000 per pupil per year, right? That's the discrepancy. And if you look at the $4,700 districts, these are all publicly funded schools, that is, public schools. They make it fail, and look, ask anybody, you've been through the education system, it's a miserable failure. I have student after student in my college, in my university classes, who cannot read at seventh or eighth grade level. And they've graduated high school, they're now in college, they're in a university. This is the failure of the public school system. Why is the federal government and the states and counties not funding public schools. We had a discussion, this is a few months back, with, uh, with um, the supervisor of education system in Dade County, Carvel. He said, we got a raise for Dade County last year. This was 2018. And the raise was 25 cents per student. And he was asking us, what do I do with 25 cents per student, you know, which is the increase? What do you really do with 25 cents? And so he was complaining how low that money is. So if you make the public education system fail, what are people gonna do? Why don't you private, hence charter schools. What are you gonna do? You, you're gonna ask for privatization because you're gonna swear up and down that private companies run these systems way better. 
This is happening in the school system. The same thing with the prison system. We're privatizing prison system because in prison, as you have come to know, there's actually more violence. There's actually more uh, drug dealings. There are actually more murders than the outside setting. Uh, prisoners are going on strike. Prisoners are actually being used for their uh, labor freely because the 13th Amendment allows that. Uh, 13th Amendment, although it took away uh, the right to own a slave, there's a clause in the 13th Amendment that says you can be enslaved if you're imprisoned, which is one way for them to still um, incarcerate African Americans after Emancipation Proclamation and put them back on the same plantations under the 13th Amendment law. So all of these things are happening in prisons, and look at the trend in prisons. Florida, Texas, California, the ones, Arizona, the ones with the largest prison system, have gone towards that privatization. So because people are saying, if you privatize, the service becomes better. So what federal government and states do is allow failure, transportation system, um, healthcare system, education system, prison system, criminal justice system. In our criminal justice system, I've said this before, and people find it unbelievable, but 95% of people who go through the court system have to cop a plea. That is, they plea bargain for possibly felonies or crime that they have not committed because they are poor enough not to be able to have a real lawyer. They get a public attorney, but public attorney doesn't really do anything because they handle about 70, 80 cases a day. Uh, so they can't afford a private attorney. Chances are if they are tried based on the Fifth Amendment that you have to have a jury of your, of your peers to judge you, if they're tried, they will get the sentence and the judge threatens them with the highest sentence, and that threatening is actually legal, according to the Supreme Court. The judge can threaten you to cop a plea. And so the whole court system is failing, and it's becoming more and more, more and more privatized. Everything that the state wants to give up, and again, this is not a conspiracy, it's actually done. I'm not saying there's a bunch of white men with cigars in smoky rooms who sit around and talk like this and let's decide the fate. Of, that's not what's happening. All of this is legal. And it's being legally done. So if it's legal, why do you even need to conspire, is, is my point. Uh, and that's also another part of um, uh, deregulation and privatization. If you look at the Koch brothers and what they have done in terms of an example like ALEC, A-L-E-C, American Legislative Executive uh, Committee. What they do, this is a practice that, it, that in most countries is actually illegal. What they do is they bring corporations and the heads of corporations in conferences with the legislators for these corporations to tell the legislators what laws they need passed in the legislature. Do you ever get a chance to sit with a senator or a representative to tell them, these are the laws I need to get passed. The, the law I need to get passed is for FIU to decrease its tuition. The law I need to get passed is for free health care. Do you ever get a chance to do that? You don't. But ALEC, which is a product of the neoliberal agenda, is an entity, again, illegal in most countries, that gets legislators and corporations to sit together to decide laws. And they actually write their laws for them. They write it for them and give it to these legislators and they take it back home to their states and they pass a lot of laws that you know, they, f they feel fit for the corporations. Economics of neoliberalism. Hayek was probably the first person who talked about um, the economics of neoliberalism as, a as opposition to Keynesian economy. If you know anything about the Keynesian economy, which is the mid-1930s, Keynes came up with the reason why we had such great depression, 28, 29, 30. And he said it's because money is not being spent. It's because government is not playing a role in the, in, in the economy and that government should be responsible for the welfare of the people. And that's when we were setting Social Security. That's when we were setting unemployment. That's why we were setting uh, minimum wage and so forth. So that, according to his theory, I'll simplify it, if you need a healthy economy, if you want a healthy economy, 
consumers have to have money to spend it in the economy, as opposed to the ways before. That is, if you don't pay workers high enough wages and they keep producing goods, who is going to buy those goods? Because workers can't buy it because they don't have any money in their pocket. So he suggested that uh, wages should be raised. Ford Motor Company, in several years after Keynesian, Keynesian idea, what they did was they raised their $1 a day salary to $5 a day. That's 500% increase in wages. Uh, if you imagine going to work in a couple of months and telling you that, you're, that your salary has gone up 400%, sort of not possible. But that's what the Keynesian economy was. That is, put money in the pockets of the people so they become consumers. And it makes sense, right? For the capitalist economy, you need consumers. And if you hear uh, economists talk about the American economy, 70% of our economy is based on consumption. That is the stuff that we buy. Uh, so if we don't have money, how are we going to buy it? Uh, as an example, an average white male in America in 1978 was making, average white male, making $46,000 and change a year. Good? That same average white male in 2015 was making $33,000 a year. $13,000 less than 40 some years ago, 43 years ago, but p prior to that. So wages have actually decreased, and where, how do we have money in our pocket to be consumers? The way we have money to, to become consumers is we borrow it, right? Everybody and their brother has a credit card or two or three or four, and they're borrowing from basic life needs to providing for their education, to buying their cars, to buying their homes, to buying McDonald's in the 1990s started taking credit cards. The cheapest food in the world started taking credit cards because they knew that we don't even have three, four, five dollars in our pocket to buy hamburgers and whatever it is, you know, the rest of the stuff they sell. And this is devastating for us because we even have to borrow four or five dollars to buy a hamburger. But look at the profits that these corporations are, are, are making, right? And that's because wages are so low. So Americans did three things to get away from this dilemma. To this day, it's actually gotten worse. The number one thing we did, which starting in the 1980s, is we released the female labor, right? Women started to go to work. Uh, in 1979, 28% of the labor in America was, was women, 28%. Back in 2016, they hit 51%. That is now more than 50% of labor in, in America is, is women. So this force that's been released into the market because households need, they can't go on with one family, one person making wages anymore or, or, or being the breadwinner, they actually need two or three. Um, in the 1960s, 50s, 60s, somewhat of the 70s, for a four-member uh, family in America to be middle class and remain middle class, you needed 40 hours of work. 40 hours of work kept that four-member family middle class, comfortable middle class, right? Today, for a family of four, to remain middle class, they need to work 127 hours a week, not 40 hours a week. So imagine you know, this force that has to be released and the money that has to be borrowed. So number one, women went to work, and that wasn't enough. Number two, Americans started working longer hours. We were for so long envious of the Japanese because we thought they die at work. We need to have that kind of work ethic. And they actually die at work, Japanese. So much so that they have a word for it. Japanese have a word for people who die at work. I don't mean like you're home and you came from work and you died. You work while you're, you die while you're working. It's called kuroshi. Uh, it's, it's devastating to have a word for that because it means, you know, it's happening all the time. So we wanted to catch up with Japanese. By the late 1980s, early 1990s, 
average American was working 180 hours more than an average Japanese. So women went to work, Americans went to also get more overtime and, and longer hours of work. And that didn't work. The third option we had, I don't know if we had or we had to come up with, was borrow money. People who owned homes used their homes to get cash because they needed to finance their spendings. And no, it wasn't going out and buying frills. It wasn't spending it on luxury items. It's actually based on the stuff that people need for basic living, namely healthcare. If you didn't have insurance and you had to pay a, a lot of people, I'm not exaggerating, died because they didn't have money to get health care. Uh, and that's what Americans had to do, borrow money. Even those three tactics, which really undermines middle classness in America, did not work and to this day is not working. Americans are working longer and longer hours. And unfortunately, in our labor laws, it's been changed. You can be contracted. That is, we won't employ you anymore. We'll contract you into some kind of a gig economy. And we can get rid of you anytime we want. You, as a worker, have no rights whatsoever. Because it says in your contract. Especially if you work in a state called the right to work state. Namely, Florida. You basically have no rights as a worker. All of this, again, is the policies of neoliberalism. That is, undermine working people, undermine middle classness. I'm not saying this is a conspiracy. These are all legal things to do, all right? No conspiracy. The point is, who's paying attention? The only thing we're paying attention to is, how much harder do I have to work? How many more degrees do I need to earn? Uh, how many other certifications and, and, and professional degrees do I need to get? That's what we're thinking. How do I invest my money to get more money? Now, these are the things that we're thinking. We're not thinking, huh, I can now rest because this is a full-time job. I'm working 40 hours and it pays for a living. Not many Americans are able to do that. Again, all policies of, of, this, of this neoliberal economy. Um, 1960 and the bit of freedom if you give up social yes yeah, well so yeah if you give up social justice we'll give you all the freedom you need I don't know I would <laughs> I, I don't think we're really left with much freedom and even the freedom we have I don't see anyone really using it we use our freedom to choose the toothpaste we use but I don't see these other things that we use our freedoms in when was the last time you used your freedom for any matters of social justice political justice or anything that matters to you and, and everybody else. Uh, not really using those freedoms. Uh, freedoms to consume, yeah, I mean, that's not a problem with neoliberalism, but freedoms to voice out what you're discontented with, to f the freedom to voice out that I need something else, there has to be some kind of change, um, that I need a raise, that the minimum, r minimum wage is... Actually, our minimum wage is the only minimum wage in the industrialized world that leaves you in poverty even though you work 40 hours a week. So voicing these things out, you really don't have the freedom of. Um, and there is, you can see, I don't want to talk about the militarization, but the police force has become heavily militarized. Uh, if you go to the streets of Tampa, you can see tanks, armored vehicles roaming around the city on daily basis. Not because there's a crisis, not because people are out in protesting on daily, on daily cases. Uh, the number of SWAT attacks in 1989 was 400. I'm sorry, 800. 800 SWAT attacks in 1989. By 2001, before 9-11, we had 40,000 SWAT attacks. Right? Thanks to Clinton because he made those criminal laws. I had students, well, not students, but one student said, SWAT broke into my house. It was a house that she was renting a room in uh, and arrested me and the other woman in the other room and said that you guys are running a prostitution ring in this house. This was an example, just one example. I mean, why do you need the SWAT force to attack two women in their 20s? So the militarization even in another 
neoliberal uh, policy is taking place. That is control. So give up social justice issues will give you freedom. And how is this freedom used is the question. Uh, so this was a, so the neoliberal idea was a, a, a response to the accumulation of 1970. So wealth had accumulated so much. So imagine this. Uh, banks and financial institutions have so much money. They have accrued so much money from the economy. They don't know what to do with it, right? At least in their own domestic countries. So what neoliberalism does is it allows you to in invest it elsewhere. You know how we always pit China against the U.S. and Russia against China and you know country against country? There's actually no such thing. If you look this up, 67% of capital that's producing in China is non-Chinese, is American and European. So how does it make sense for the Chinese government to be concerned about that? And how does it make sense for an American investor who's producing and becoming a billionaire in China opposing Chinese policies? So I know we hear that countries pit against each other, right? And I know you hear that this country doesn't like the other country. But the world is, in fact, being run, in fact, not, no exaggeration, by the 2,000 largest corporations in the world. That's how the world is being run. So when you hear this country against the other country, it makes no sense because capital is international. Capital is global. No one person, Nike doesn't belong to the US. Uh, Mercedes doesn't belong to Germany. Toyota doesn't belong to Japan. Uh, Hyundai doesn't belong to South Korea. None of that is true. Largest companies are not owned by the population of any specific countries. They're all transnational. So neoliberalism allowed that, which is you can go beyond borders. And in fact, these corporations have done exactly that. So these are some of the numbers on inequality. In 2018, eight families, this is in the world, uh, have had more wealth than the bottom 50%. That is, eight families have more wealth than 3.7 billion people. More than half, half the world population, 3.7 billion people, lives on $5.50 or less. Less than 1% of the world's population owns 46% of the world's wealth. And the poorest, 70%, own less than 3%. So you put 70% of the world's population, that's close to 5 billion people. 5 billion people have 3% of world's wealth. In 2015, the top 1% of the families in the United States made more than 25 times the bottom 99%. More than 84% of all products, services, 84, 84% of all products and services actually being used by 10% of the population. And it's not like we're using it; it's a, it's an elite that's using it. I want you to pay attention to something. Um, you see products that middle class, working class, lower middle class consumes in America. And if you look at, if, I mean even cars, the, the commodities that are used by middle class and lower than that are always in low uh, demand because people don't have money to buy them. So you can go to these malls, either stores have gone, gone bankrupt or the entire mall has gone bankrupt or the shopping center. That's true, as far as we're concerned. But look at luxury items. Luxury items are, are tremendously increasing in number of production. Makes sense, right? Because all of the wealth is flowing to the top. So expensive jets are being purchased, right? While we don't have money for McDonald's. Uh, expensive watches, all expensive, super expensive commodities are being purchased and purchased at a very alarming rate because the money exists up there, but for the rest of the population, I don't mean just Americans, but of the world, we don't even have the money to buy the products that we, we produce. Um, three individuals in the U.S. own more wealth than bottom 50%. That is, three people... I think it's 
Gates, Bezos, and Buffett together, they have more money than 165 million people. I don't know. If you don't think that's devastating, uh, you need some coffee <laughs> to wake up. Uh, so these are the movements against neoliberalism, as far as I've, I've seen. So women is part of, and this isn't just American women, women worldwide are rising against some of these because poverty is actually uh, heavier for women. Women are the ones who are getting the lowest wages and women worldwide have been, because of culture, because of training, because of patriarchy, are the lowest paid and then also the most pliable, right? They're manipulated easily. Uh, I read a study a couple months ago that in a span of, this was a study on how many times women ask for a raise in America. On a span of six years, they were looking at men and women uh, asking for a raise. In that six years, men asked an average of 14 times for a raise in place where they worked. In those six years, women asked zero times for a raise. So, you know, more pliable in that sense. And this is by training, right? You're a woman, you shouldn't be so assertive, you shouldn't be asking because people don't think you're the main breadwinner, so forth and so on. And these are some of the reasons why. Um, racism, still rampant. When Obama became president, we talked about post-racial America. Not true. Uh, when Obama became president in 2008, in America there were 318 uh, white supremacist armed groups, right? 2008, end of 2008, beginning of 2009. When he left office, there was 1,025, an increase of 300% in white supremacist armed groups in America. So you show me this post-racial stuff. Uh, and you can see racism, and I don't just mean among the population and those who support Trump. I also mean panned out, racism panned out by government institutions. And that's the guiding line for us. Uh, homelessness, take a look at homelessness in states like Florida, California, New York, so forth. It's just rampant. Um, and they're fighting. Urban community de decay, uh, look at what's going on. And you can practically drive around large cities in the US and see, I'm not exaggerating, you know what I mean, the third world within the US. There are only certain parts that look like the so-called first world, the industrialized world with infrastructure, with you know, the, in, the clean environment, so forth. You drive around large cities in the US, you see the third world. In some cases, our statistics in terms of health and, and birth are worse than many third worlds. And there's been a, a fight as far as that's concerned. Gentrification, in Miami is a prime example of gentrification. Pushing out the brown and the black and the poor and bringing in the upper middle class white uh, go and take a look at Biscayne from 36th Street down to Miami on the east side. All gentrified. And these really tall buildings, which is only about 35-40% 35, 35, occupied. So they're not even, after gentrification, able to sell these apartments. Financial expropriation, that is, that means you, any money you make, you have to pay for your debts. That's how they expropriate you. A prime example of financial expropriation is um, by 1973, average American had $500 in their savings account. You know, if you average it out, back then the population was 210 million. Average American had $500 in their savings account. You multiply that by the population, that's billions and billions of dollars. Expropriation of that money started with giving out credit cards to everyone. By 1973, only 5% of Americans had a credit card. By early 1990s, 82% of Americans had credit cards. That's how you expropriate that money. 
You say, you got $500 in your account? Here's a credit card. Spend $5,000. And not only you give me that $500, but you're also paying me interest later for all of those. Um, am I being long-winded? Sorry. <laughs> Um, and of course, environmental, I think there's a really big movement as far as environmental concerns, uh, which is good. Uh, but let's see, most of our politicians deny it, and they think that there's no science backing that up, but, you know. So this is the future. This is my prediction, by no means, you know, the future, but what I think. Um, and this is happening not within a year, I think. And I'll tell you why. I'm not just hypothesizing out of the blue. Um, collapse of the stock market. You can see remnants of that right now. Uh, collapse of real estate market. I'll tell you why. Let me just read it and I'll tell you why I think that. Fewer areas of investment uh, for accumulated wealth. Wider gap between the rich and the working population more costly middle class, lower wages and stagnating wages. So from the top, collapse of the stock market. Stock market is a bubble. That's its nature. Because it's not based on production and services. It's actually based on what people think and hypothesize something to grow. And when the first thing that goes, because stock market is actually digits. It's not real dollars. The first thing that goes when people, and it has to start by, you know, smallest uh, movement of non-payment, which is how the 2008 uh, stock market collapse happened and the crisis happened. As soon as an entity says, I don't have money to pay back this debt, which is digital only, the entire thing will collapse. In October of 2008, the stock market fell 500 points. Overnight, that's $5 trillion. How does $5 trillion collapse overnight? If you had, uh, if you had productive backup for $5 trillion, that is, if you produced $5 trillion worth of chairs, right? can that disappear overnight? No, because it's a product. The worst is it goes down in price. You know, your $5 trillion becomes, I don't know, $3 trillion. But it can't disappear because you still have the commodity to back your wealth up. And because this wealth is based on non-commodity, non-service, it's only based on speculation, that's why it collapses overnight. Because it's not based on anything. It's based on me trusting you when I give you $10,000 to return to me $12,000. And if you say, I can't return, what am I going to do? Because that's only a number now. Uh, collapse of real estate, that happens all the time. The reason why real estate seemingly is going up right now is not because there's a shortage. It's because monopolies of real estate, large real estate corporations, don't put out all of the homes that are for sale and that have been foreclosed. They put them out by bits and pieces so it doesn't look like there's an abundance of homes. Because if there's an abundance of any commodity, prices go down, prices drop. So they have to make it look like a false supply. You understand? And that's why prices haven't been going up. And even if they are going up, they will collapse back on to what you saw in 2008. That is, a house that was worth a million dollars became worth in two years, a year and a half after 2008, $270,000. More than 370, 360% of the cost of the house actually dropped. And that's what I predict will happen also again. Fewer areas of investment and accumulated wealth. That is one of the biggest fundamental problems of neoliberalism. That is, there are no areas to invest. If you drive on Collins Avenue, Simply, look at the buildings. You have an Armani building. You have a Porsche building. You have these people that have nothing to do with development but are now all of a sudden in building buildings. And it doesn't make any sense. The way it makes sense is because these companies that have accumulated wealth 
can't even invest in their own products anymore. Armani, Porsche, and so on. Because there is no market for it. What can they invest in? Real estate, which they think will give them some return. And even real estate won't do that. If you ever, I mean, you should do this. If you ever travel to China, don't go to Beijing and Shanghai and see these buildings and people. Go to these areas, false cities. There are cities in China without a population. I don't mean an old city that was built, it's rural and people have left to, to go to the city. I mean newly built cities with new buildings, new streets, new sewer system, new infrastructure with no population. Because there are no areas of investment. And you can't, if you produce more of the commodities that we have every day, prices will drop. And no liberalism, capitalism doesn't want to do that. So they have actually, two countries of India and China, with today's about 70% labor capacity, just those two countries, can in fact produce all of the commodities needed in the entire world which means the remaining 198 countries don't have to produce anymore. Can the capitalist class in these countries really afford that? Non-production? So instead of taking all that money and producing more and more commodities, what they do is they build buildings, false cities. That's what's happening with this accumulated wealth. So these are my solutions. Don't tell any presidential candidate this. <laughs> So I think as a result, and we will get this, I swear this is not hypothetical because there's been movements in America and worldwide to do this. These six things have to become free uh, unless we're going to face barbarism. I mean like slavery or close to it. Free health care, free child care, low cost or free public transportation like built as an infrastructure. Free internet, because without that, I mean, internet is more of an infrastructure now than roadways, I think. And free higher education, and also a living wage. I think minimum wage belongs to people from 16 to 18. Yeah, make minimum wage because you're not even essentially responsible for your own, you know, uh, independence. But anyone after that, 18 and on, should get a living wage. Living wage, had we not de-linked de it from when it was set as minimum wage in 1938, would have today been close to $24 an hour. But we de-linked it in 1970s, so now it's ridiculously low, 725 federally. So those six things have to be established for anyone in anywhere in the world to be able to actually live like a human being without feeling the, the stress and the struggle and so forth. All right, thank you. Any questions? Yes, okay, so on. Hi, um, so when you see um, billionaires like Bezos, Bill Gates are donating to countries that have um, no resources, do you think it's adding to the inequality or is it solving it? I, so if they're becoming billionaires, is it adding to? No, like since they have the money and they're trying to help other countries, do you think by oh, giving because resources? Because of their philanthropy. Yeah, do you right. think that's helping solving the problem or is it adding more to the problem? Um, it's not, so the nature of their work, you know, what they, their com the companies they have is adding to the inequality because they need to use that labor to enrich. Uh, but the question is, is their philanthropy helping? The philanthropy is helping the day, right? It's not helping the infrastructure or the, the actual economies for these people to get out of poverty. It helps them momentarily. It's sort of like that old saying, you know, you give me a fish, I live for a day, teach me to fish, I live, I live on. So it, it, philanthropy works that way. Also, philanthropy only happens because there is accumulated wealth. 
So it's like the after product of the, of the exploitation. It doesn't happen before exploitation. It happens after exploitation. I, there is no evidence that it actually decreases the inequality. I know that Bill Gates, for example, spent a lot of money on uh, malaria and you know disease like that and AIDS and so forth, a lot of money. But I don't think that does anything in terms of decreasing inequality because their companies are progressing, if you want to call it that, with the same way of production, with the same way of paying the workers. And one thing, I don't know if I should add this, but uh, the reason why wages are so low is not because they're afraid of you and me. They're actually afraid of their own competition. As soon as a company lets up on, on, on offering such low wages, their competition will eat them up. So that's what they're afraid of. And so the inequality has to continue. That is, the low wages have to continue. Actually, it's not just low wages and the stagnation of low wages. The drive down to the bottom will have to continue. So superficially, it looks like they're helping, but their system of production doesn't change. So that's still keeping up with the, you know, the more inequality. Uh, good afternoon. So um, you said don't talk about politicians, but I'm going to talk about politicians. So, you know, it's interesting. I think of the six items on your list. Um, Bernie Sanders has about three of them, really, Ooh. basically. Yeah. Shh. And no, but so the interesting, the other f candidate that I think is very interesting, because I think this would have been a taboo subject in American politics up until recently, is Andrew Yang with a guaranteed basic income. So I don't know of any politician before this year that said basically we're going to give everybody in America, whether yeah. you work or not, yes, a guaranteed right. basic income. Right, right. Do you think this, there's something unique about this moment that there's a politician who's actually running on that? I, I, I really do, yeah. Well, maybe he's not, he didn't originate. This is actually taking place in Switzerland. Switzerland decided a couple of years ago to give every citizen, like you said, regardless of income, what have you, age and so on, well, over 18, $2,000 and change every month, basic income for everyone. And the hypothesis behind that is it's, it's, it's backed up by research. So whether I agree with it or not, it's actually a proposal that sort of proposes that a lot of poverty would be get, gotten rid of. And they even have done research on, well, what if people abuse it? You know, and there's almost no chance for you to abuse it because it's the basic income that everybody receives. But you're right, though. It's a original idea, not from Yang, but, you know, past two, three years, some countries are or or actually it's not just in realms of theory and idea they're practicing it and from stuff i've read you know switzerland they report that it's working yeah i mean he says a thousand right yeah, i believe he's just saying a thousand dollars a month right 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 hi is this working hi i have a i have a question about the things you're listing now what comments or what would you say to someone who like for example, comes from like a Cuban or Cuban American background who sees things like this and they're like, this smells like socialism. It smells like, like Lucifer, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, Cuban background. <laughs> I always tell my um, students who have that background, right? So not just the uh, ethnic background, but it's sort of an ideological background. That's what you're talking about. I always say between what happened and happens in Cuba and the American alternative, right, there's a distance. Between those two alternatives, there are a thousand others, which is one of them is this. So you don't have to go to the extent of Cuba if you're afraid of that, you know, not you, but, you know, the people you're talking about. If you're afraid of that, think about this extantly, that is, think about the consequences of what I have up, and also the stuff that neoliberalism has done, right? Think about it independently, and think whether this is a solution or not. This doesn't say, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of 
this is my sort of like the populist alternative. I have another more radical alternative, but I don't think that U.S. population is ready for that. But this would include 330 million people, right? And I, you can get whoever, whether Russian, Cuban, whomever, people that, are, that have run away from socialism, communism, you know, those red words, tell them to think about these things as whether a person living needs them or not, you know, independently of where they've come from. So free health care is not just in Cuba. It's in most industrialized world. Um, free child care also in most industrialized world. It's not a Cuban example. Uh, Low-cost transportation, most of the industrialized world. If you go to Sweden or Denmark or Norway, you can buy like a $67 monthly pass, no matter what transportation you get. The entire month. What's wrong with that? It's a Swedish model. It's not a Cuban model. Uh, and, you know, and the rest. Free internet in a lot of European countries exists. Like free internet. It's not a Cuban concept. And the higher education and the living wage. It exists in most of the world. That's not Cuba. So I don't think, I don't, I don't think that's Cuban related is what I'm trying to say. But I understand the context um, of your question. I mean, so I'm, I guess what I'm asking is not so much that it's more of a Cuban thing. It's more like the fear. So let's say like higher education, for example, the fear of like where is this money coming from and who are you putting in those positions to make it possible? We had higher education that was free. You could go to Berkeley in the 1970s for free. That wasn't a Cuban model. It was an American model. Do, do you know that? You could go to CUNY. CUNY, Berkeley, SUNY, you know, really good schools in New York and California for zero dollars in, in tuition. Those same schools, if you want to go to Berkeley now, it's going to cost you $30,000. We didn't go from the Cuban model to the, I don't know, non-Cuban model. We went from an American model to a neoliberal model. So that's happened here before. I don't know if you know, but during Truman, I'll give you something Cuban. <laughs> that rhymed. Uh, during Truman, the richest in America were taxed at 91% of their profits. Is that Cuban enough for you? It happened here, 91%. So it existed in this country. It didn't exist on Mars or Lucifer's country. It existed here. So I have a few comments and like questions. So your, I, like the idea, the solutions you have they're, they're, you're correct, they already are in place. Like Japan's like the biggest example of that low-cost public tra transportation, free healthcare, and like a living wage. Only thing was like they're the, you die when you work. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's not I, I, I know people from Japan, like they actually, that's a, it's a problem that they're actually trying to solve now. But um, my first question relates to what you were talking about privatiz privatization. I had friends that went to charter school they said their education wasn't any better. Like it wasn't a difference. They were paying for school, but they weren't paying for a better education. I went to public school, but I felt my education was a little bit better compared to them, even though Florida's education is not that great. But the privatization of prisons, that also doesn't make sense to me. Cause do you think, you, I understand it's not better, but do you think that there can be a difference in that? Like if they can stop the privatization, cause it, honestly it just hides what they were already doing publicly in, prison, in prisons, but now they're hiding the murders and like the drugs and the, all the other things inside the prisons. Right, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, I'm also a criminologist and I don't really want to get into too much detail. We'll start with your last question. Um, the entire prison population, you know, who ends up in prison is a failure. So I think if we were to, yes, privatization is a problem, I, I agree. Uh, but if you were to really pay attention to the problem, it has to start from who goes to prison, right? You can be poor, black or brown, and not commit an innocent, but be in prison, but rich and white and guilty and not be in prison. But again, not as a conspiracy, based on whether you have a lawyer or not. So... If we want to start a discussion on prison, I don't think it should start with privatization or not. I think it should start with who are the inmates? 
And why do we have the largest prison population in the world? It, that's, and why are they you know, mostly black and brown? So 6.2% of, of the population in the US is African American male, right? 6.2%. They are in prison 41% of the population. Do you see that discrepancy? That's what we need to start to talk about. And primarily, not necessarily the privatization. But privatization occurs not because they're concerned about rehabilitation. The word rehabilitation is not even used in most of the states in their laws. Punishment, punishment, punishment. And then we have recidivism of 80%. You understand? So the problem is even worse with privatization. That is, we do the same thing, but we still get the highest recidivism. Since we started privatizing, recidivism didn't go down. It went up, which is a whole different you know, category of what neoliberalism has done for, for crime. Well, I understand all that, and I have one more question, but it's related to the, your solutions here. Wouldn't that mean we would have to reinstate taxes, higher taxes on the more wealthy, but wouldn't that be difficult if most people do not want them to be want to be taxed, like the people that have more money? Because if they were if they were taxed more than what we are currently taxed, it would basically allow all this to happen, correct? Yeah, I mean, sure, a lot of the money would come from there. But I'll give you an example: the three people I mentioned yeah. that have more money. Do you know how much pay they made? They paid in taxes. 2018. I don't, we don't have 2019 numbers. Zero dollars. Why is somebody who made $20 billion in profit, not you know, profit, paying $0 in taxes? And I don't even want to get the military involved. We spend $1.1 trillion on the military. That is, they have a $770 billion budget. They get half of the discretionary budget, which is another $300 billion. We spend $1.1 trillion on military spending on 920 bases in 130 countries around the world while we have the third world going on in the US. Why is that going on? Why isn't some of the defense spending going to the population? Now, I, if the argument is we're over there because we don't want the terrorists to come over here, I need to sit down and talk about that. I can't just take that rhetorical statement as fact because that's not what's happening. So there's plenty of areas where you can take the money and assign it to population, to the infrastructure, to education, health, and so forth. Sorry, really quick. I want to be mindful. Some, some of you might have classes. This is really interesting, so I want to keep going. And for all of those that want to um, stay here, please. Um, but if you have to leave, we understand. And we, um, we are here to sign up um, your documents. And with that, let's continue with the questions. Got it. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Matthew, and I currently, hey, you know, I, I tend to st stray towards uh, a lot of more moderate policies, but something I tend to really feel passionate about is uh, currently I'm an accounting major, and as a result, for the most part, I feel there's a lot of different parts of our government that aren't working to fulfill their opt near, even remotely amount, their optimal, uh, optimal amount of, of uh, caring capacity for what they want to do. So my my situation is... I'm sorry, um, you said people in government are doing? Yeah, a lot okay. of government okay. services aren't providing as much as they're spending. So like you said, in terms of the military, you know, I very much want to see that, you know, they're spending absolute tons of money overseas, yet, you know, if you look into the financial reports as to what they're spending it on, I remember seeing an article a couple of years ago saying that, you know, $2.6 million was spent on firewood and 98% of it wasn't even used. It was just thrown away. Yes, right, and right. that's stuff that, that's American dollars that could be helping people. And it's not a matter of, oh, I'm anti military No, it's just, there's money that's just being thrown away. You're right. Yeah. And, you know, and the quality of service isn't coming there. And so uh, my alternative real question is, um, in the case of this rising situation we have with big tech companies, right, with uh, big pharma, right, there's a lot of candidates both on the liberal and conservative side that I see, such as conservatives panning out towards the NRA and towards other places there. And if you're on the liberal side, a lot of um, uh, liberals from this side who are spent taking money from big tech companies, who are taking massive profits, um, in all honesty, how can we find somebody that we can really trust and, and find when both sides of the aisle seem to be pandering towards their corporate needs 
and their actual helps instead of the actual American people, especially considering that the majority of the money isn't going to where it needs to be going to? That's a good question. And the answer, I think, is simple. Um, in 2010, the Supreme Court passed a law, you know, Citizens United, that, you know, Citizens United, right, that it says that all politicians are now a commodity. You can buy them. I'm not, I'm, I'm not kidding. You can actually buy your politician. So if you're like the Koch brothers who, who said we will give uh, $1 billion to our favorite candidate, one bill, uh, who has $1 billion to give? To, what, do, what, does he ex, what do they expect in return for a billion dollars? As long as that's law, that is, politicians can get millions and billions of dollars from corporations, individuals, what have you, I don't think anything can be saved or said about how much power we have. I think some law has to go against the Citizens United law to overturn that, to say that you can't, for example, give more than a certain amount of money because it used to be, I think, $100, what have you. So uh, something like that, or maybe the French alternative, I'm not saying we should, but uh, it sounds good. French government says, you know, six candidates, right? I have $100 million I can assign to, to you six. They divide the $100 million into six. This is your money. Go out there and campaign. Nothing else. So based on certain amount of money for everyone, instead of somebody who's a billionaire or somebody who gets um, funds from a billionaire, you know, you have people who contribute $70 million to a campaign. $34 million to a campaign. How are you and me going to compete with that? Do we even count by giving, I don't know, what is it Bernie asked for, $2.70? Like, what is, that doesn't even, it, it's just a drop, you know, proverbial drop in the ocean. So I think that law needs to change. And then politicians should get a certain amount of money and then spend it on campaign and that's it. Instead of, because I just don't, it doesn't make any sense to the Constitution, to the Bill of Rights, whatever, that politicians should be for sale. Uh, and that's, I think we, sh we can start there, overturn that law. Right? It's, it's really simple. And people have the power, legislators have the power, people in Congress have the power to overturn it. It can go to Supreme Court again, what have you. So that's the solution, I think. And plus, I really agree with your military comments. I mean, it's ridiculous the way we spend money on the military. There's no, there's no accountability. That's the reason why. Yes. So I was watching a video, and this guy was saying, eventually, like, prime ministers, president will be useless, since, like, entrepreneurs are, like, oh, you mean they're useful them. now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're here. They're just, like... Not doing anything. Right. Like eventually, like they're not gonna be a thing, right, right. since like entrepreneurs are solving the world problems. Oh, so do you think that would be the case? Like we would not need presidents. I, um, well, I mean, it's the case now. Symbolically, we have presidents, prime ministers, secretary of this, and minister of that. We symbolically have them, but like I said, major decisions. Uh, I, I don't just mean business decisions and economic decisions. I mean laws are being put into place, fomented by corporations. Today, it's not the future. It's been a while since, and that's why I'm talking about neoliberalism. It's, it's being practiced right now. Corporations implement policy. And so government or state, the presidents and the prime minister, are at their service. If you don't believe me, take a look at all the laws that's, that, that have been passed in the you know, past 20, 30 years. It's exactly that way. Not the future, I think it's the present. Oh yeah, yeah, last one. Um, so question just... Hmm? No, I say I'll stay. Oh, okay. Um, the last thing, uh, I remember you mentioned um, following like, this, like the Switzerland um, oh, formation okay. form that they have right now. Those European countries are usually mono um, ethnic. How do you feel like can we model that with such with 
race isn't so heavily rooted in the American society, or at least this part of the world, do you think that has anything to do with um, the problems? You know, you mentioned the incarceration, mass incarceration of black men, you know. So you mean the what Yang proposes of the basic salary for everyone yeah. can only be done in a monolithic or monoethnic so it's not monoethnic but let's just say yeah, France what have you word, yeah. um, and so right I don't I don't think I mean look certainly race in America is heavily tied to class and that's why even academically speaking theoretically speaking we haven't decided which comes first, that is, which one is more oppressive. Uh, my theory is that because they were born together in America, so you, they're inseparable. While that's true, um, I don't think Americans putting pressure on government to make those changes, not even the basic salary stuff, but the raising of minimum wage, has much to do with race. I know that blacks and browns have more to gain from that because um, as a matter of fact, a black man with a college bachelor's degree makes as much as a white man with a high school diploma in America. And there are so many statistics that are similar. But I think it benefits white, black, brown, you know, all ethnicities through America to bring up those wages or to, you know, propose a basic salary. I don't think um, there will be opposition. I, I understand what you're saying. But then opposition is mostly coming from not a white population or a non-black or non-Hispanic population. Opposition is mostly coming from corporations who don't want to raise a minimum wage or give out similar proposals or have similar proposals presented to our politi through our politicians. So while that's a problem, I don't think that's where the main opposition is, is what I'm saying. Sure. Thank you so much, and I'm sure... Thank I'll you, <laughs> everyone. This Thank was, you. Uh, that's why this is the fourth time, right? <laughs> we have to keep um, bringing him in. But thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for staying. And I'm sure if you guys have questions, can approach yeah. Dr. Avi. Yeah.